the civil warriors here this evening. Uh, the start of our 23-24 uh, season, and it's a real pleasure to have with us tonight uh, Dr. Brian Matthew Jordan, Associate Professor of Civil War History and the Chair of the History Department at Sam Houston State University. Uh, did his undergraduate work at Gettysburg College. I'm sure we all know where that is. And then received his uh, doctoral degree in history at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Dr. Jordan is the author or editor of six books in the Civil War era. His Marching Home, Union Veterans and Their Unending Civil War was a finalist for the 2016 Pulitzer Prize in History and in its dissertation form, won the George Washington Eggleston Prize for Best U.S. History Dissertation at Yale University and the John Addison Porter Prize. A Thousand May Fall, an Immigrant Regiment Civil War, the subject of his lecture this evening, was a main selection of the History Book Club. Just out from the University of Georgia Press, his final resting place is Reflections on the Meaning of Civil War Graves, which he co-edited with Jonathan White. He has contributed chapters to a dozen other anthologies and has published more than 150 articles, book reviews, and essays. For the past decade, Dr. Jordan has served as book review editor for the Civil War Monitor. He's appeared regularly on C-SPAN and was featured in two episodes of the History Channel's 2020 miniseries on the life of U.S. Grant. And he has addressed Civil War roundtables in 28 states. Perhaps this is 29. He is currently one volume history of the war for the university, W.W. Norton. A native of Northeastern Ohio, he lives near Houston with his wife and two-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, who has already visited four battlefields. So please welcome Dr. Brian Jordan. Bottom right has a little projector screen. Should. I guess it's not. I should love technology. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so very much uh, for being here this evening. It is a great privilege uh, for me to join the roster of illustrious speakers who have addressed the Scottsdale Roundtable. Um, it. Um, is a, a special uh, treat for me to be here this evening. Uh, flying into Sky Harbor Airport uh, yesterday uh, brought many memories back. My grandparents maintained a, a home in Litchfield Park for many years. And so touching down at Sky Harbor brought back uh, lots of happy memories of spring breaks and Christmas vacations spent here. So uh, really truly this has been something of a, of a homecoming uh, for me. So thank you all. Uh, for the invitation. From their position on the campus of the Adams County Almshouse, a trio of buildings that sat in a neat row along Gettysburg's northern edge, a regiment of Ohioans surveyed the wide flat plain that extended before them between the Carlisle Road and the Harrisburg Pike. To the west, a, a sequence of sturdy ridges creased the ground, and an unfinished railroad trace gashed into the earth. But out here, north of town, there was no cover, no shelter, no refuge to be found. As the men looked to their front on this warm July afternoon, they spied only the slight earthen knob that locals called Blocker's Knoll. War makes a habit of promoting otherwise unremarkable ripples in the ground to sudden significance. And in that respect, this day would be no different. Atop that forlorn rise, a precocious young division commander, 28-year-old, clean-shaven, 
Harvard valedictorian Francis Channing Barlow would unlimber four Napoleon guns, shake out a skirmish line, and plant a tiny brigade. Stretching the thin blue ribbon of troops coiled about Gettysburg, just about as far as they could stretch. Shot and shell soon winged overhead, of course, the first portent of enemy soldiers massing for an assault. After what seemed like a lifetime, the men of the 107th Ohio Volunteer Infantry were nodded forward toward the knoll to brace the beleaguered Union line. They advanced with heavy steps and knotted throats, some inserting one last cheekful of tobacco. To be sure, such a daunting errand might have given any such troops pause, but it was a distinct dread that flooded these Buckeyes. For almost exactly two months before, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, these men had been among the very first troops crushed under the weight of Stonewall Jackson's flank attack. That daring maneuver that delivered some 26,000 rebels to a federal line that derelict commanders had left dangling dangerously in the air. In mere minutes, Jackson's howling troops added more than half of the 107th Ohio to the war's ever lengthening register of killed, wounded, missing, and captured. Now on this first July afternoon of the war's third summer, once more deployed to the extreme right flank of an overextended Union line, once more fighting under a new army commander, it seemed as though the past was repeating itself. The historian Leslie Gordon has observed that many Union soldiers ached for an unambiguous story of their wartime service and sacrifices. Free of anything embarrassing, unmanly, or dishonorable. But the men of the 107th Ohio, I think, came to understand their participation in the Civil War rather differently by tallying and indeed taking pride in the enormous suffering, losses, and sacrifices they had experienced both on and off the battlefield. The men of the 107th Ohio were especially anxious to demonstrate to a politically divided citizenry back home that they too could battle no less manfully than their native born comrades in arms. 1862, from a dozen northeastern Ohio counties, the 107th was an ethnically German regiment. Very nearly 70% of the men on its muster rolls were ethnically German or foreign born. Now, immigrant soldiers, of course, were hardly unknown in Lincoln's armies. More than 200,000 ethnic Germans would don Union blue between 1861 and 1865, and nearly as many Irish. But most of these men fought in native-born outfits, or else were shoehorned into individual companies within native-born regiments. Remarkably, only about 30 of the more than 3,500 military organizations that comprised the United States armies during the Civil War were true ethnic regiments, outfits in which immigrants outnumbered native-born men. And so the 107th Ohio could count itself on a rather exclusive list. But even as language and ethnicity, and popular perceptions of their fighting prowess set them apart, I think it's fair to say that they weathered the numbing human ordeal of the war in some typical ways. They were, as I write in the book, men betwixt and between. Men who belonged, but did not. They whipsawed between hope and heartbreak, duty and dereliction, cynicism and conviction. With little fanfare, they shivered in squalls of snow at Brook Station in Virginia and flagged under the fevers of Folly Island in South Carolina. They swatted at gluttonous mosquitoes in camp and navigated treacherous roads on the march. They battled 
treasonous rebels at the front and then exchanged taunts with contemptuous civilians back home. They resisted with equal vigor, both Republican radicalism and democratic defeatism. They knew the taste of victory. Participating alongside the famous fighting 54th Massachusetts, the African-American regiment, in a rail-twisting raid that drove into the heart of the Palmetto State in April of 1865. More often than not, as they had at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, they felt the ache of defeat. Chancellorsville, again, their strength was halved. Two months later at Gettysburg, the experience was to be there repeated. When they returned north, they were left to tend to the onerous errands of memory and to the agonies of the many sick, wounded, and disabled men among them. Toggling then between the war's extremes, the men of the 107th Ohio, I think, can help us to complicate our picture of who Billy Yank really was. Recent historians have rendered two starkly different portraits of the Union common soldier. According to one body of scholars, Billy Yank was steel jawed, sure footed, self restrained, motivated by patriotism and a keen sense of what was ideologically at stake in the war. Escalating demands of the contest, according to this body of scholarship, paid Billy Yank remarkably little trouble. If anything, experiences under fire in close proximity to the material realities of slavery served only to magnify and amplify his convictions. These historians, I think, have exaggerated the courage, pluck, and determination of Billy Yank on the battlefields of the Civil War. But still another body of scholarship has served to foreground the Union soldiers' anguish, misery, and woe. And these accounts by the likes of Gerald F. Linderman and Michael C. C. Adams, the natural, physical, and psychological deprivations of war, quickly erode the youthful idealism that first inspired Yankees to enlist. On bloodstained battlefields, Billy Yank, again, according to this body of scholarship, confronted the stark divide between the glittering war he imagined and the gruesome war he was actually asked to fight. Both views, both bodies of scholarship, I think have over time revealed some important truths about Civil War soldiers and service. But I think these bodies of scholarship have equally effaced the war's lived complexities, the extent to which the war was at once a tale of pride and pain, of courage and cowardice, of life and death, of loyalty and betrayal. We've lost a sense of how these things were braided together. In short, I think the men of the 107th Ohio can restore to our view the muck and murk of life in camp and on the march, the very demands of, of carrying on, standing guard, simply putting one foot in front of the other, the satisfaction rarely discussed of having suffered, sacrificed, and somehow survived. By recovering how a particular community of men navigated the mercurial face of war. Regimental histories, I think, are ideal vessels for rendering more complete, more capacious, and ultimately more inclusive narratives of our nation's deadliest conflict. Regimental histories render legible that liminal space between lived realities and ennobling national myths. Unit histories help us to see that spaces, places, and environments shaped soldiers' attitudes toward the war and informed their understanding of the combat. They help us to see that experiences between battles and behind the lines did as much, if not more, than combat to inform regimental identity. 
and they help us to understand the trauma of a civil war engagement when it did come ripple out in time and space to annex the lives of survivors and the families and the communities back at home for generations. Now, for the 107th Ohio, that war began the summer before Gettysburg, the summer of 1862, when Ohio's war Democrat Governor David Todd authorized the creation of the fifth ethnically German regiment from the Buckeye State. There would ultimately be six. The German Citizens Military Committee canvassed the state's northeastern counties for recruits. And among the 994 men, who answered that first roll call were stonecutters and shoemakers, butchers and blacksmiths, tailors and tinsmiths, carpenters and clockmakers, masons and millers, weavers and watchmakers. In short, they were drawn from virtually every aspect of life. And they tally just nearly as many reasons for marching off to war, so many that their combat motivations mock any sort of neat categorization. Reports that the regiment would reinforce Franz Siegel, the revolutionary emigre turned Union general, according to one enlistee, acted like a charm and aroused great enthusiasm. Still others yearned to follow in the martial footsteps of revered ancestors who had battled in the American Revolution or the War of 1812. For still others, pecuniary inducements appealed more powerfully than patriotism. Perhaps most remarkably in this unit, 20 young men stole away from Zor, a communitarian society on the Tuscaroras River, persuaded that their pacifism was no longer plausible in a war that was clearly a war about emancipation. Now the regiment first snapped to attention at Camp Cleveland bustling training complex sited on about 60 acres immediately south of its namesake city. With fewer than three weeks of training under their belt plates and shoddy Austrian muskets that elicited a righteous grumbling from all on their shoulders, the 107th Ohio set out on its first assignment, its first wartime errand. Earlier that summer of 1862, a rebel raid had looped to within about 60 miles of Cincinnati. And though the immediate threat to the Queen City had passed, Ohio Governor David Todd was not going to take any chances. He ordered his fresh recruits into the earthen works that coiled about Cincinnati and northern Kentucky in an effort to reassure those yet uneasy denizens of Cincinnati. If the care with which 21-year-old John Brunny, a regimental musician, described it is any indication, the unit's first march into Kentucky proved a formative episode. At first, things moved forward accompanied by song, Brunny explained. But then the temperatures rose and the haversacks grew heavy. Muscles became sore. Thirst set in. Cursing officers struggled to keep men in the ranks as they lost their courage and collapsed along the side of the road. This first march invited the men of the 107th Ohio to reconsider its naive optimism about the war and to distinguish immediately between cowardice and straggling. Further, when it was revealed that the unit had spent the entire day in Kentucky marching in circles, that its destination could have been reached in just one hour. The men were uh, made to openly question the perspicacity of their leaders and some of the more rank absurdities of war. Indeed, as this first episode reveals, a dread of inadequacy, a deep sense of self-consciousness, these things came to afflict the regiment. They would become their touchstones, their hallmarks. The men were impatient for action, eager for an opportunity to prove their fighting mettle. Yet even a welcome transfer to the seat of the war's eastern theater in the Old Dominion in the late autumn of 1862 
not occasion that much sought after rendezvous with the rebels. A porridge like muck instead plastered Virginia's roads and arrested any forward progress. With all the marching that we have done, we've not done anything toward ending this war, one foot sore soldier from the 107th lamented. Instead, Moored in place, the men of the 107th Ohio settled in for what proved a very long winter, north of the Rappahannock River, shivering in squalls of snow and ice as waves of dysentery and diarrhea and typhoid made deadly romps through the ranks. The winter encampment of 1862 to 63 indeed proved a most formative experience for the regiment not unlike that first march in Kentucky. Operational historians have long recognized that the many months the Army of the Potomac spent moored on the Rappahannock amounted to a strategic pause, a prized period for the troops to rest, restore, resupply, regroup forces. But less fully appreciated in the literature, I think, is the extent to which this winter encampment, what some historians have coined the Army of the Potomac's Valley Forge, invited sustained reflection among enlisted men both about their participation in the war and the peace movement that was then rapidly gaining adherence on the northern home front. Indeed, the winter encampment of 1862 to 63 neatly coincided with the ascendancy of the anti-war Copperhead Democrats, whose leading exponent, of course, was an Ohioan, the Dayton area congressman Clement Laird Vallandigham. Vallandigham delivered an anti-war, anti-Lincoln, anti-abolition tirade on the floor of the United States House of Representatives on January the 14th, 1863 the very day the 107th trudged toward its new campsite at Brook Station. Throughout the North, of course, many Republicans and even some war Democrats decried this defeatism. But nowhere, I suggest to you, did this opposition to Copperheadism blaze with more righteous indignation than in the camps of the 107th Ohio. From their winter huts, the men penned letters and ratified resolutions, expressing their desire to see the war prosecuted through to a vigorous conclusion. If they don't want us to come down here and fight, one of the units enlisted men recommended, why let them keep their mouths shut and not disturb us? I will leave my bones to bleach on the battlefields of the sunny South, he retorted, before I will say compromise. Or enough. All I ask, another of the Buckeyes insisted, is for those who know nothing of war and its ravages to hold their mouths and not discourage those who are risking their lives in an effort to restore a tottering government to its former position. Idealizing then their shivering, suffering, and their sacrifices. The men of the 107th Ohio in these resolves, in these letters, invited a rather deliberate contrast between their own martial masculinity and what they perceived to be the unmanly agitation of the stay-at-homes. Some of the men even expressed candidly their desire to return home and engage the Copperheads in open combat. In an intrepid editorial, one private proposed to send home some of our weather-beaten soldiers armed with guns and bayonets and 60 rounds of cartridges. Christian von Gunden, who shouldered a rifle in Company I of the 107th, indeed agreed to forego his much-anticipated furlough if and when he could be issued orders to confront the Copperheads. Halfway business is about played out, Christian Schreiner explains. It would indeed be a deplorable thing if, if civil war should break out within the North, but it can, if it cannot be avoided in any other way than by yielding to the Copperheads and the Mudsill rebels, I say, let it come. Now, again, scholars have, have rightfully lauded 
administrative, dietary, and hygienic reforms championed by Major General Joseph Hooker. Their role in reviving the flagging morale of Union regiments on the eve of the Chancellorsville campaign. But no less significant, I think, are these many months of restless immobility spent in camp, which supplied men with a precious resource, time. Time to reflect on the anti-war opposition back home. Time to reflect on the war and their service, clarifying exactly what was at stake in the contest. Indeed, Copperheadism served to promote an ironic sort of unity among the rank and the file of the politically fractious Army of the Potomac. Christian Schreiner put it rather openly. The more the Copperheads rave, he explained, the more determined we men in the Army get. But that renewed strength and unity, of course, would be soon sharply tested. When the Army of the Potomac stole through the tangled timber of a second growth Virginia forest, finally engaged Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Chancellorsville the first three days of May, 1863. For its part, the 107th Ohio, after its flank march, they shook out into a line of battle at the Tally Farm along the Orange Plank Road, anchoring again the extreme right of a federal line that was left dangling dangerously in the air without anchors to its flanks. Throughout the morning of May the 2nd, 1863, the second day at Chancellorsville, reports about an ominous buildup of enemy troops on that end of the Union line proliferated at Army headquarters. The warnings were repeatedly waved away by hapless division commanders. Indeed, as dusk approached, the, the general apprehension that had for hours been rippling through these regiments finally began to subside. And then came disaster. The sole omen of Thomas Jonathan Jackson's flank attack, that lone artillery shell that came hurtling into the Union ranks about 5 p.m. 20 minutes later, with the crushing power of an avalanche, as one soldier described it, Confederate brigades neatly arrayed on both sides of the Orange Turnpike, Robert Rhodes' oversized division in the lead, tore into the unsuspecting flank of the 11th Corps. Hearing the wild shrieks and demonic yells of whiskey-baited rebels, it seemed to one first lieutenant in Company D of the 107th, as though the population of the lower regions had been turned loose to devour our men upon the spot. The initial shock of this bewildering attack quickly yielded to chaos as Union troops scrambled pell-mell for the rear. Ohioans scampered into their second line of prepared entrenchments. According to the 107th Jacob Smith, an ambulance wagon driver, it was here that the battle now assumed the appearance and character of a massacre. The bullets, Christian Riker marveled, the bullets just whistled by my head like a real hailstorm. The men squeezed their triggers and stood as long as a stand could be made before falling back in full retreat. If we'd remained just five minutes longer, insisted one soldier from Connecticut who fought in the 107th Brigade, we should have all been killed or taken prisoners. As it was, the rebels inflicted staggering losses. They killed, wounded, or bagged as Richmond Libby-bound prisoners, some 220 men in the 107th Ohio in the space of about 20 minutes. No less vexing than the physical injuries and losses, of course, were the psychological consequences of Chancellorsville. Almost immediately after the battle, Godfrey Kappel, one of those recruits from Zor, began to manifest symptoms of nervous fever an ailment that soon became epidemic, his word, in the regiment. He is unaware of what is happening, his comrade Christian Riker reported in late May. Often Godfrey wants to leave, and when one asks him to where, he says to his home in Zor. 
Only weeks after the battle, Sergeant Charles Weimer was reduced to the ranks, being incapacitated by insanity. Citing his feeble state of health, the perilous condition of his company, and the recent trials and hardships to which the regiment was subjected in the late battles of Chancellorsville, First Lieutenant Hamilton Starkweather simply resigned his commission on the spot. More than a few men indeed were unable to sustain that initial enlistment idealism. If we are asked what was gained by our brave loss of men, the regimental musician John Brodell insisted plainly, why the answer is no gain at all. Now, though the collapse of the 11th Corps line in no way preordained the Federal Army's crushing defeat at Chancellorsville, nor the newspapers, as you can see here in this woodcut, they would effortlessly seize upon the so-called stampede of these ethnically German outfits as the devastating battle's decisive moment. Cleverly effacing the failure of native-born leadership to provoke the crisis in the first place, cleverly effacing the reality that Joe Hooker had an opportunity to win on May 3rd. Threats and treaties and orders of commanders, these things were no avail. The Daily National Intelligencer seeds from Washington, D.C. Thousands of these base cowards threw down their guns and soon streamed down the road toward headquarters. For weeks, the false-hearted allegations, embroidered with a real ugly nativism, served to annex northern newspaper columns. The northern press, one perceptive contemporary observer commented, was anxious to lay the blame for the defeat at Chancellorsville upon the door of some despised foreigners. Think of it. Only months after indicting the Copperheads for their own misdeeds, men of the 107th Ohio now found themselves in the surreal position of responding to allegations of cowardly conduct heaped upon their own. In answering these charges, the men further organized and clarified their ideas about service and loyalty, clarifying the nature of their commitment to the war effort. I saw yesterday a letter from home, Lieutenant John Winkler reported, stating a report that our company left the battlefield and ran at the first appearance of the rebels without firing a shot. In a tart epistle that he addressed to the editor of his hometown newspaper, the Worcester Republican, the Wayne County soldier explained that it was his duty to inform friends back at home of the facts. We went forth to do battle for the Union and the Constitution, he wrote, and we want to be used decently and not abused. In sharply worded missives, the men cataloged painstakingly the battle's human destruction, wielding lengthy casualty registers as evidence of that brief yet hopeless stand. The memory of the noble men gone to their graves, now languishing in hospitals, another correspondent from the 107th added. is entitled to this plain, unvarnished statement of fact. Indeed, for the ethnic soldiers of the 11th Corps, the struggle to establish what happened along the Orange Turnpike at Chancellorsville would be nearly as trying as the battle itself. But in this fight, Second Battle of Chancellorsville, they would enlist the support of the larger German American community. From Lower Manhattan to the east side of Cleveland, Ohio, mass meetings assembled to rebuke the calumniators and to hurl the slanders back upon the teeth of their fabricators. At the Cooper Institute in New York, made famous by Lincoln in 1860, Friedrich Kopp, an ethnically German refugee who it penned several stirring accounts of Hessian contributions to the American Revolution. Kopp leveraged his authority as a historian to denounce at the Cooper Institute the defamation of the 11th Corps is altogether dangerous to the Union cause. Because I never knew a soldier, he explained, who was willing to fight the enemy in the front when his comrades or the people from whom he fights stand ready to stab him 
from behind. The 107th Ohio then had scarcely taken inventory. The tragedy that had befallen them along the Orange Turnpike, when again, two months later, they once again found themselves in the thick of the killing. At Gettysburg, the men quite literally fought in the shadow of Chancellorsville in search of a redemption that would continue to elude them. Atop blockers, Noel and men stood their ground and shot as fast as they could, one explained. One Stark County volunteer reported that he managed to squeeze off three rounds before a shell knocked his musket from his hands and broke it all to pieces. Before long, the federal lines up there on Blockers Knoll collapsed under the overwhelming pressure of an enfilading enemy fire delivered by George Pierce Doles' Georgians and John B. Gordon's men splashing across Rock Creek. The Ohioans abandoned that deadly perch to which they never should have been assigned, offering what resistance they could as they scrambled to the rear. Back at the house where they had begun the afternoon, the 107th adjutant, Peter F. Young from Cleveland, gripped the regimental colors in a daring, defying attempt to rally the dazed remnants of his regiment. The retreat through town on July the 1st, 1863, was harrowing. It was especially so for the unit's ambulance detail. Think of it, obliged to wind wagons, heaping with grievously wounded and injured men through the confused, gnarled masses congesting the borough's narrow streets. We was not long in finding sufficient wounded soldiers to fill our wagons, Jacob Smith shuddered in understatement. His grisly cargo testified to the intensity of the fight atop the knoll. One soldier, for instance, had been shot through the mouth, the musket ball entering through one of his cheeks before exiting out the other, ejecting four or five teeth and severing his tongue pretty near off. His life appeared to have been saved by the small Bible that he carried in a pocket over his left breast, into which still another piece of enemy lead had lodged. For the second time, folks, in as many battles, for the second time in as many months, the 107th Ohio had been thrashed. Of the 458 fighting effectives who entered the battle that afternoon, no more than 171 would limp to the unit's new position behind a low stone fence that rambled along the base of East Cemetery Hill. There, the very next evening, another bloody fight awaited. A twilight action that swirled desperately around well-poised federal batteries, Michael Wiedrich's guns from Buffalo. There, despite what had happened to them the day before, the Ohioans stood their ground, repulsed Harry Hayes's much-feared Louisiana Tigers, captured the colors of the 8th Louisiana and secured the anchor of the Union fishhook line and set up the battle's cataclysmic final day. It was an amazing reversal of fortune for the 107th OVI. But again, going back to this theme of self-consciousness, going back to this deliberate foregrounding of misery and suffering. Decades later, when the 107th, along with other Ohio outfits, was invited to plant a monument at Gettysburg, they chose not to place it here, the scene of their greatest triumph, the scene perhaps of their redemption. They planted that marker, erected at the state of Ohio's expense, atop Blocker's Knoll. That was the moment that defined their service. They wanted to remind Americans, even decades later, of exactly what they had been willing to sacrifice. That for them was more important than the victory. It's incredibly, incredibly revealing, I think. The save the occasional crack of a Confederate sharpshooter's rifle, the 107th Ohio, of course, anchored here at East Cemetery Hill, would not come under fire on July the 3rd. He instead listened with nervous anxiety to the din of the rebel cannonade that proceeded to pick its charge. After another restless night under arms, 
They advanced down Baltimore Street on the 4th of July into the borough, the first Union regiment to enter the borough proper after the battle. And though the battle had been won for the Union, it was, of course, no time for celebration. Gettysburg's panorama of death overwhelmed the senses of men even well acquainted with war's devastations. Bodies swollen to twice their original size, littering the fields north of the borough, the air incredibly rank. The odors were nauseating, one soldier commented, and so deadly that in a short time we were all sickened and we were all lying with our mouths close to the ground, most of us vomiting profusely. The thrashing rain on the 4th of July made Jacob Smith's already unpleasant task of evacuating the wounded all the more disagreeable, requiring his team to ford swollen creeks and to trudge through thick mud. His creaking wagons would deliver several loads of groaning and gangrenous men, among them a 24-year-old shoemaker named Casper Bohr, whose gunshot wound below the right knee would necessitate amputation. And Jacob Hoff, a Clevelander who wouldn't make it through the night, he would deliver them to the farm of George and Elizabeth Spangler. Fronting the Granite Schoolhouse Road, the 156-acre property became the 11th Corps Field Hospital and, of course, before long, a crowded phone yard. Demonstrating its peculiar capacity to thrust young men into previously unthinkable roles. The war made Alfred J. Ryder, the sturdy son of Navarre, Ohio, into a makeshift undertaker. The regimental postmaster had been detailed to the Spangler Hospital by the surgeon in charge, 28-year-old Dr. James Armstrong. Ryder worked without respite throughout that night and the ensuing days, lowering the dead into freshly made graves recording their names for history in an old farm ledger, collecting what remained of their personal effects when possible <clears throat> for shipment back home. It was physically and psychologically, emotionally demanding labor. Tracking back and forth between the hospital and the regiment to deliver frequent updates to impatient comrades, Ryder actually claimed to have worn through the souls of his brogans orchestra of human mystery went on and into the night. Shrill cries and heartrending groans of dying soldiers, the only serenade on this 4th of July. The grief of Gettysburg indeed would continue to prey upon the regiment as Chancellorsville had before. A doleful drip of reports from hospital wards and hometowns where men tended to injuries would continue to find the regiment that fall. And each time one of those reports arrived, of course, it would activate and reanimate old memories they tried to suppress. Many of these dispatches found the 107th Ohio adjusting to the muggy tropical climb of Folly Island, South Carolina. What one private likened to a dreary and worthless collection of sand hills. In a humiliating move that seemingly confirmed the pejorative assessments of the press and the jaundiced assessments of their detractors, the 11th Corps was abolished in 1863, whisked from the Army of the Potomac, divided, part of it sent to the Western Theater, part of it sent to the Department of the South. The 107th Ohio would be with that contingent that was whisked to the Department of the South, unceremoniously ushered to the war's margins, obliged now to mark time and to prowl about on picket, made to exchange gray clad enemies for a host of natural ones. It was mortifying, embarrassing, humiliating for these men. Moored in exotic camps far from home, subjected to mindless drill and monotonous fatigue duties, they betrayed their dejection and gloom as only they could in their letters and diaries. We looked every hour upon the same naked beaches of sand, one man explained, the same drooping palmettos. Unable to escape the thought that they had been consigned to irrelevance, the troops no longer 
shined their shoes or folded their gum blankets or polished their muskets. They snubbed most military conventions, which now seemed but empty ceremony. Deprived of the opportunity to participate in the headline-seizing battles of 1864, they instead chronicled with great fidelity their campaigns against sand fleas and scorpions, <laughs> wood ticks and mosquitoes. In this way, they could continue to suffer and indeed even bleed on behalf of the cause. Keeping body, mind, and soul together in 1864 would be a challenge as great as any they had faced at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. And indeed, it took a toll. By the fall of 1864, most of the men were simply looking for an end to the war at any cost. Another rather remarkable reversal of fortune. Indeed, the 107th Ohio would be unique among all Buckeye State regiments in delivering a plurality of its ballots in the 1864 presidential race to the Democrat, George B. McClellan, because Little Mac, the men supposed, was likelier than Lincoln to end the war. It is strange, remarked one Connecticut soldier brigaded with that unit through much of the war, that men who have endured so many hardships, who periled so much for their country, should be so blind and ignorant as to support that which is working to destroy all of the good that they've ever accomplished. And George McClellan, of course, would not have the opportunity to do just that. Lincoln, as you know, was comfortably reelected, and the Union war effort at last showed signs of forward movement. Even the 107th Ohio got one more opportunity to confront the Confederates, real Confederates, in battle. Sprite fight alongside the men of the 54th Massachusetts at a place called Dingles Mill near Sumter, South Carolina. The Ohioans acquitted themselves on this expedition, which is called Potter's Raid. It's a little studied campaign and undeservedly so. It's a fascinating episode in April of 1865. Um, drove right into um, the heart of South Carolina, delivered the war deliberately. This is part of Sherman's effort to deliver something of the war to the cradle of secession. They acquitted themselves very, very well. So well, in fact, that the episode that you see here illustrated on the screen is a young private named Henry Finkenbinner earning for himself the Medal of Honor for his daring rescue of two wounded comrades who had been caught between enemy lines, dashed across a burning bridge that spanned Turkey Creek. It was the height of heroism. But just as luck would have it, right, these heroics and this performance at Dingle's Mill would be effortlessly, easily eclipsed by the news coming that very day out of Virginia. Because Dingle's Mill it was fought on Sunday, April the 9th, 1865. <laughs> at the very moment the Ohioans were squeezing their triggers along Turkey Creek, of course, Robert E. Lee was waiting for Ulysses S. Grant in Wilmer McLean's parlor at Appomattox Courthouse. The 107th Ohio, I mean, they would have said this was just their luck. Um, they continued to chase the Confederates through the heart of the Palmetto State, this lucrative 17-day rail-twisting raid it was punctuated by no fewer than, than four military engagements, Boykins, Mill, Camden, up uh, very near the, the Revolutionary War battlefield. The 107th Ohio, at this last opportunity to really equip themselves well. Before being packed off to occupation duty in Shellpock, Charleston, which is where they would round out the last weeks of their service. And it was there, too, that they finally received those coveted discharge papers, having packed a lifetime into two years and 10 months. But the peace that followed the war, of course, would be as complicated as the conflict itself. Inviting penury, renewed prejudice, and protracted battles, both with the Pension Bureau and with a host of ailments. To sample just a few Mind from their pension files, chronic diarrhea, fever, chills, gangrene, 
consumption, constipation, dysentery, liver trouble, deafness, blindness, shortness of breath, fluttering of the heart, nervousness, insanity, alcoholism. Ugly wounds prevented Frank Rothermel from opening his mouth ever again more than a third of an inch. Theobald Hasman from ever again raising his hands above his head. Peter Scheib from extending his arms. A shell wound not only deafened Lance and McKinney, a bricklayer from Stark County, but left his face badly disfigured. Together, these men bore witness to the war's violence. Furrowed brows and unsteadied gates, supplying compelling testimony about all that they had seen and experienced. In a war, something indelibly inscribed on their bodies, something they were never able again to escape. To the very end, indeed, the men of the 107th Ohio believed that their many months of suffering had granted them a certain singular authority over the war and its meaning and its historical narrative. During the conflict itself, of course, they asserted that authority by resisting numbing fatigue duties and registering their distaste for discipline. As veterans, they drew on that authority to demand a new and more capacious definition of sacrifice, suffering, and indeed even the war itself. Much more than extraordinary deeds, they reminded Union victory demanded everyday medal of the sort that was put on display in disease-choked camps and overcrowded hospital wards, on those protracted mindless marches and remote picket lines as they impatiently marked time and suffocated from self-doubt. Empty sleeves were honorable scars, they contended, but so too were frostbitten toes and crooked fingers, raspy coughs and labored breaths, deafened ears and blind eyes. Neither convinced that they had climbed to the snowy heights of honor, as described so famously in Elegy by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Nor entirely ready to concede that the war had been some irredeemable folly, some orgy of meaningless violence. The regiment instead fused pain and pride together into a singular interpretation of the war. Loss and anguish were, for even the most sentimental among the veterans, fundamental to the conflict's meaning. Celebrations of the war's results, the preservation of the Union, the end of chattel slavery, always implied a reckoning with what it had cost. As one scholar recently observed, veterans revisited the terror of their combat after the war, if only to take greater satisfaction in the comforts of a hard-won peace. Their sacrifices, they believed, bespoke their loyalty. And though the legacy of emancipation indeed divided the men in pieces that had divided them during the war, no one could deny that they had stood by the flag in the face of a rebellion. The nation, however, preferred to move on. And so it was that in the twilight of the 19th century, the poet Walt Whitman could declare that fervid atmosphere and typical events of the war were in danger of being totally forgotten. Not a few of the regiment's veterans, too, sensed that their rather unique war had not gotten into the books. In 1906, Martin Boyer appealed directly to the editor of the nation's leading periodical for Union veterans, the National Tribune. Please, he said, please publish a short history of the 107th Ohio. I am a reader of the National Tribune, but I have never seen anything in the paper concerning my outfit. The intuition that the regiment's experiences had not been adequately recorded, that they were not accurately captured in the larger national narratives. Similarly inspired that ambulance wagon driver, Jacob Smith, to put pen to paper on a unit history. He hoped tellingly in 1910, that something of the toils, dangers, labor, and hardships of 
ordinary soldiers in the Civil War might finally, with his book, find their way into print. I've never thought in, in word or deed, never regretted what little I'd done for my country in the way of duty, he wrote at the end of his now long forgotten book. But I've always been proud that I'd taken a humble part in the great strife. Confident yet self-conscious, acknowledging the yawning void between the war he waged and the war his adopted nation preferred to imagine. The old soldier, I think, had penned a fitting epitaph for the 107th Ohio. Our histories, indeed, are rarely peopled with the likes of these guys. But until we reckon with how, and indeed by whom, our nation was saved, our understanding of the Civil War, I think, will remain impoverished. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Be happy to entertain your questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, very remarkable presentation. Thank you. Um, with the horrific losses in the 107th, um, we often find throughout the war, rather than sending uh, replacements to the regiments, oftentimes new units were formed or consolidated. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a little, you seem to have a, a good history of this unit. Can you tell us much about their replacement levels going towards the end of the war and when they were down in South Carolina? Mm -hmm. So they, there were several efforts to replenish and imagine uh, that the first of these efforts is in July of 1863. So it's right after Gettysburg, before the transfer to the Department of the South. Imagine this duty, right? You've, you've just come off of Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, and now you say, join up with the 107th Ohio, right? We've taken 52% losses in every battle that we participated in, right? <laughs> Who wants to join up? Where do, where do I sign? Um, they do go home and, and recruit. Um, and then at the end of the war, as you suggest, there is a consolidation between the 107th and another outfit that had been brigaded with them uh, in McLean's brigade at uh, Chancellorsville and then in uh, Ames's brigade at Gettysburg. This is the 25th Ohio, uh, which came out of the northwestern part of the state. There's a consolidation there. Um, and so a lot of these guys... Um, getting at them, which sources proved one of the great challenges of this project, but you can get at them um, in particular through the 25th, which is a much, um, much better documented uh, regiment. So there is that consolidation. And of course, that um, kind of in the environment of the regiment has its own cost effects, right? Um, um, with with men feeling that they're really not part of the fabric of, of the unit. Of course, they've been in the brigade, but that regimental identity is really something that's that's unique. Gary Gallagher has rightly called regiments the, the atoms of, of Civil War armies, and there is nothing like that regimental identity. Even the, the brigade, the division, the corps, that, that's all well and good. You can put the, the, the corps emblems um, on your kepi, but it was nothing like the unit identity. So that too was a challenge. And I think that's one reason that things start to fall apart for them in 1864 is that a lot of these guys are, are just, it's, it's new blood. And they're not the comrades that were shoulder to shoulder with them at the Tally Farm uh, or up there at Blockers North. Yes, sir. Uh, we were talking about after the dissolution of the 11th Corps, uh, when they got shifted to the South, yep. uh, they kind of lost faith in the Republican war aims yep. and voted for McClellan. Yep. After the war was over, did you find any evidence where they tried to kind of, where they had regret for that or kind of tried to disown that? So there's not, there's not direct, that's a great question. There's not direct evidence of, of any regret for that, although there is lots of evidence uh, of activity in the Grand Army of the Republic and activity in posts that were known for being um, outspoken, uh, outspoken Republican. Uh, so I think that there is a, a movement. I think it was a temporary movement that was kind of rooted in a, a frustration with where the war was at that moment. And then I think there's a gradual move back um, to the Republican Party. But th this gets to one of the, the central points of the book, which is that we so often 
capture Civil War soldiers. We, we, we cherry pick the quotes, right? And we say that that one experience, that one quote, that one letter or diary extract represents the entirety of his experience. And it's simply not true, right? Uh, these soldiers whipsaw between um, uh, all different sorts of, of attitudes and perspectives on the war. I love, I, I, I generally subscribe to James McPherson's argument in For Cause and Comrades. He argues in that book, of course, that Union soldiers were ideologically motivated. They understood what exactly was at stake in the war, right? The fate of self-government, uh, democracy, and uh, the question of slavery. And they understood these things. But McPherson, what he does in that book is to pull out quotes that support those arguments, which again, I generally subscribe to. And it flattens out that soldier's experience um, to that one moment when I think if you get down to the regimental le level, uh, you see just how, how wildly things um, can move. And it's a reminder that these guys are peering through the fog of battle. They don't know how it's going to turn out. Right? They're animated by a sense of contingency. Um, they have no idea what the next day is going to bring. And, and restoring to view some of that uncertainty, I think, is, is absolutely what we have to do in our narratives. We know how the story ends. We know the major pivot points. They didn't. And understanding that they move between these things um, all the time, reminding ourselves that people were, were horribly uncertain is a really, really important exercise in helping us to get back into the mindset of 1860. Yes, sir. The photo here, it looks like that's a reunion, and what approximate year was that? So, so this is September the 14th, 1887. This is uh, what was called Ohio Day uh, uh, at the Gettysburg Battlefield. It was the day that Ohio supplied $50,000 to each of its infantry regiments, artillery batteries, and cavalry outfits that have participated in Gettysburg, 13 all told. Um, they gave $50,000 to each of those units and said, design a monument. Um, here is a, a, a curated list of, of monument designers and architectural firms that you can choose from, but pick out your monument, design your monument, and then place it wherever you would like on the battlefield. So this is the about 40 survivors of the unit who came back and took the rail trip um, paid for by the state of Ohio out to Gettysburg uh, to dedicate that monument, um, 107th Ohio Monument. So if you know the Gettysburg Battlefield at all, uh, it's uh, right where the Alms House Cemetery is on Blockers Knoll, just, uh, just short of the, um, the knoll. Uh, this monument's right along the, what is today the Park Tour Road a non-historic road there, but they came back and had the dedication ceremony. Major Augustus Vignos, who lost his arm in the fight at Blockers Knoll, was the, the keynote speaker. Um, the governor of Ohio was there. It was a major, major event. And um, of course, lots of these Northern states did this sort of thing all throughout the 1880s and, and 90s. A remarkable, remarkable photo. Yep. To what extent did other units there I think that, at least for ethnic Germans, the 107th experience is, is pretty consistent um, with uh, what they had experienced. Lots of, um, of, of nativism in the press, even within the army, kind of a sneering condescension within the army. Uh, one soldier um, from the 17th Connecticut, whom I, I quoted several points. I mean, you can kind of hear when he's, you know, responding to their vote for George McClellan. You can kind of hear the condescension that they had. I mean, they were just not uh, well-loved or well-looked upon, well-understood, even within the army itself. And I think that's borne out by, you look at their experiences after the war. Uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Barbara Gannon, has written a, an excellent book uh, on the Grand Army of the Republic, the major union veterans organization, and the question of race, African-American membership. And you know, she discovered that the remarkable thing that the GAR was the only non-segregated fraternal society in Jim Crow America, right? I mean, the, the, uh, the bonds of comradeship transcended race, even in, in Jim Crow America. African-Americans um, 
were an integrated GAR post. They had their, you know, they were part of the organization. They became junior vice commanders. Um, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, Barb has determined that it was more difficult. This is remarkable to me. It was likely more difficult for an ethnic German to gain admittance based on her study of all of the records. It's more difficult for an ethnic German to gain admittance to the GAR in the 90s than it was for an African-American. And I think that's that's a, a pretty remarkable illustration of the, the depth of the antipathy. Um, as late as 1896, right, Augustus Choate Hamlin, who was the son of Lincoln's first vice president, he writes one of the first histories of the Battle of Chancellorsville. And he's interviewing all of these folks in the 11th Corps, and he's the one who's documenting exactly what happened. And his mailbag, I mean, this is bursting with all of these soldiers who three decades later still want to set the record straight, who still want to clear their name. Many of these guys went to their grave feeling that uh, that record was not cleared. Um, and indeed, it's only until very, very recently in the scholarship that we're starting to get a fuller picture of, of, of what happened to Chancellors. Yes. Who was the founding colonel of this regiment? What happened to these five war? It's a great question uh, and a story of itself. Uh, the founding colonel was Seraphim Meyer, uh, who had uh, absolutely no military experience. Uh, he had been a pre-war uh, Douglas Democrat. He was actually uh, one of the uh, electors for the state of Ohio uh, for the Democratic ticket in 1860. And then secession happened and he was outraged. He left the Democratic Party as the party of, of secession. And he was rewarded for that uh, stance, which was rather unpopular in his uh, area of Ohio with the colonelcy of this new regiment. Well, he goes off uh, to become uh, he, at Chancellorsville. He is captured. Uh, he sent off to uh, Libby Prison uh, for a period of about six weeks. But as a part of that uh, ambush, really, by uh, Jackson's men out there at the tally place, as he's being hauled to the rear, he watches as his son, who is the captain of Company C, Edward Meyer, um, falls with a pretty significant wound. And he thinks that he's witnessed his son's last moments. And turns out that Edward Meyer survived that injury uh, would return to service in time for, for Gettysburg. But he goes off to, imagine this, he goes off to Libby thinking that he has witnessed his son's last moments. So he's got not only the, the humiliation of enemy capture, but um, the moment that no father wants to, to witness. So the two reunite. They have this remarkable reunion six weeks later in Ohio. They rejoin the outfit at Gettysburg. He goes up there to Blocker's Knoll. And the records demonstrate Seraphim Meyer becomes the only federal colonel court-martialed for cowardice as a result of the Battle of Gettysburg because he abandons the unit um, right up there on Blocker's Knoll. And historians have, you go read David Martin's book on the first day, Harry Fonz, uh, any of the, the classic July 1 studies, and none of them really agree on this. Um, I drilled into the, the court-martial records, into all the witness testimony. This, there are histories out there that suggest he was drunk and, and that rely on a lot of ethnic stereotypes. I think the, the most careful reading of the evidence, the most humane reading of the evidence suggests that what he experienced up there was really a flashback to that moment at Chancellorsville. And he thought that this was going to happen all over again because the circumstances were exactly parallel. And so he broke, broke and he bolted and he ran. And he's brought up on a court-martial, um, um, drum barrel um, court-martial hearing in Mountsville, Virginia in August of 1863. And they hear the testimony and um, the proceedings of the trial are thrown out on a technicality because the, the JAG didn't swear in uh, the witnesses uh, in his presence. And so they throw it out on a technicality, which is probably the worst thing that can happen for him because he doesn't have an opportunity to clear his name. Um, they've got it out for him. They get down to Florida in the Department of the, of the South in February of 1864. They start testing the knowledge uh, of uh, delivery of orders and tactics of a lot of these politically appointed colonels. And they find him absolutely wanting in the ability to issue orders. 
and they they drum him out. They cashier him. 107 gets a new colonel for the last year of war, a Chicago attorney named John Snyder Cooper. Um, uh, Seraphim Meyer goes back, is elected to the um, Court of Common Pleas in Stark County. Nobody ever mentions uh, this Gettysburg episode, which I think is powerful evidence that everybody understood exactly what had happened. They weren't going to indict him for abandoning them at this hour of great need. They understood and shared that unspoken uh, human empathy about what had happened. Goes out to Santa Cruz, California, dies there in 1894. Yes. If you could go back to this regiment, and interview anyone, any one individual, who would you want to interview? When would you interview them? Where would they be, and what would you be your first two or three questions? Yeah. <laughs> What a fascinating question. Uh, I think about this all the time when, you know, the, the people that I would like to interview in the afterlife. And actually, it's a great fear of mine because, I, you know, I fear that they'll say, you know, to have a list of everything that I got wrong in my books. Um, but I would probably turn to that cohort in Company I um, that stole away from Zor. These 18, 19, and 20-year-old boys, Godfrey Kappel, Christian Riker. Um, these men who stole away from Zor, who, imagine this, right? They, they leave a pacifist communitarian society, and then they have to come back. They, we, we know what reintegration is like for Union veterans. We know how difficult it is for ethnic Germans. Think about it for these guys. They have to come back to a pacifist society. Um, I would want to know what exactly that experience was like. Um, the conversations that they were having with their families. Um, again, a clearer sense of their conviction. What, what prompted them to do this? I know that the, the records, again, suggest that it's, it's the, the overwhelming issue of emancipation, but I want to tease that out um, um, pretty dramatically. So I think it would be uh, those 20 guys in Company I, uh, for sure. Good last question. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, do you have any idea what the percentage of first generation you know, actual immigrants that were in that unit? So I, I do, um, I don't have it out off the top of my head, the, the percentage of first generation. Most of these guys, though, uh, were relatively recently arrived. They came over um, some in the, the migrations that happened after the revolutions of 1848. Uh, but there was a huge wave of ethnically German immigration to Ohio in around 1852, 1853, and the vast majority. I mean, there were some who had some roots uh, in Ohio, but the vast majority come over in 52 or 53. Um, and um, so, so many of them, I would say, certainly a plurality uh, are first generation. All right. Well, thank Dr. Jordan once again for being here. Thank you so much.